I will go ahead and turn it over to Virginia to introduce today's speaker. Sure. Hi, I'm Virginia Holman. I'm the chapter leader of Island Wildlife. Um, we're happy to have Bonnie Monteleone here today. Bonnie is the director of science, research, and academic partnerships, as well as the executive director of Plastic Ocean Project Incorporated. As a researcher who's collected plastic marine samples globally, including four of the five main ocean gyres, the Caribbean, and has extended this work to Pyramid Lake outside of Reno, Nevada. She completed her first field study ex exploration in the North Atlantic gyre in 2009 with Woods Hole Ocean Oceanographic Institute and Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science. In the fall of 2009, Bonnie accompanied Algalita Mar Marine Research Foundation's 10-year resampling of the North Pacific gyre, quantifying the rate of plastic marine debris growth to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, sampling a transect of 3,460 nautical miles. She serves on the board of the directors of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, her parent organization, and supports numerous interns and environmental groups in the Cape Fear region. She is a local visionary and powerhouse, and we are delighted to have her with us today. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you, Virginia, really for, for sharing all of that. And, um, and, you know, this is something that I could probably talk about all day. Uh, got a lot to go over, and a lot of it has to do with just the, the, the willpower of North Carolina. We are all very fortunate to live in a state that really does care about the ocean and the habitat on the terra firma. So um, without further ado, I would love to share my PowerPoint. I promise you it's going to be a heck of a ride, but uh, we're going to learn a lot. And uh, we're going to, by the time you're done, recognize that these efforts that so many nonprofits are um, involved in are actually making a big difference. So um, the title of my talk is Save Our Seas, Save Ourselves. And it's with good reason, you know, with all the environmental problems that the world is facing right now, Plastic plays a role in it in one way or another, and that also includes climate change. So I thought I'd start with uh, just really the, the extent of this plastic problem. So as I had mentioned, with a lot of the environmental problems that are happening in the world, plastic has some role. And one would be oil spills or um, the use of petrol products. So uh, stats based on 2017, uh, we use about 20 million barrels, not gallons, but barrels of oil per day in this country. And about 6% of that is used to make plastics. Now we also make plastic out of um, natural gas. So this is just what we do with the petro products from the ocean. And that adds up to about 1.2 million barrels of oil a day just to produce plastic. Now the real crisis here beyond what we're already witnessing today is the fact that the oil and gas industry recognizes that we are moving away from combustion engines and they have to find a place to sell this fuel or oil and therefore they're their goal is to increase plastic production by 40% within the next 10 years. And they're sinking over $180 billion in order to do so. So it's really important for us to pay attention to what we're seeing on the shelves. I'm, I'm sure many of you start have started to witness that more and more things are now moving from being in glass to plastic that once were in cardboard that are now in plastic and now even like fruits and vegetables are now wrapped in styrofoam and plastic even though they already have their own uh, food shield around them like the skin of an apple. 
So this slide just gives you the, the horrific uh, representation of just what that plastic increase has happened since the 1950s. And if you were to look at um, human population rates, it would follow the same curve as well as cancer or health issue rates and also extinctions. So as human population has increased, the population of the natural world is in huge decline. So what, what do I know about this plastic in the ocean? Well, I have, uh, as Virginia mentioned, I've been to four of the five uh, main circulation systems in our world's ocean. And I say ocean because it really is just one ocean. They are all connected in one way or fashion. And one of the ways that it's connected is along the equatorial line. So this serves as a, as a circulation boundary that separates the Northern Hemisphere from the, from the Southern Hemisphere. And therefore it breaks up the North Atlantic or the, the Atlantic and the Pacific. So I've been to four of these gyres. In 2009, I started the research in the North Atlantic as a graduate student at UNC Wilmington. And my thesis question was, if plastic is accumulating in the North Pacific, is it accumulating in the North Atlantic? What I didn't foresee is that this question would actually take me to four of these five gyres. So in 2009, I joined El Galita Marine Research Foundation that had the longest running research in the North Pacific garbage patch. And we sailed on a 50 foot catamaran from Rio de Janeiro, or sorry, from uh, Hawaii to uh, California uh, over 30 days at sea. Uh, again, I traveled 30 days across the South Atlantic from Rio de Janeiro to Cape Town, South Africa, another 30 days at sea, and then uh, five years of sampling in the North Atlantic. And then in 2012, I joined a film crew from the BBC uh, were, who were producing the film, A Plastic Ocean. And so they flew me to Fiji to show them how I do my surface sampling and also how we dissect fish looking for plastics. So out of this work, I ended up starting the nonprofit Plastic Ocean Project. And our motto is education through research, outreach through art and solutions through collaboration. And I'll get into those three aspects here shortly. Just wanted to briefly go over what I'm talking about when we are doing these surface samples. Uh, we actually use a Neustan net that is typically used for studying plankton, um, but the, the, um, the mouth on this manta trawl is about a meter across by a half a meter deep. The net uh, holes are so small, you can't even push a straight pin through. And we travel at about two or three knots, um, and then we vary, vary the time that the sampler is in there from 15 minutes to an hour. And this is basically what we're finding. So when we talk about, you know, the island of trash in the North Pacific, it's, if we were to call it an island, it would be called an inverted island because most of the plastic is hanging down in the water column. And then you have these microplastics that are on the surface and most ubiquitous. And of course, as these plastics break down into smaller particles, they become more bioavailable for all living things in the ocean, all the way from plankton to blue whales. So there was a moment as a graduate student that I realized that I wasn't going to just defend my thesis. I was going to have to start a nonprofit. And this is that very moment. Before I headed off to uh, climb on Charlie Moore's boat, we went to one of the dirtiest beaches in the world and that's Camilo Beach in Hawaii. And I'm just gonna run this short video illustrating how plastic is now becoming plastic sand in certain parts of the world.
just keep moving on. But you get the idea, right? So this this beach, and it's not even in a developed nation, is just covered with with this plastic. And it was really that moment when I realized that I would really hate to see our beaches start to look like that because once it starts, you can't stop it. Um, so combining what we're finding in the ocean that's estimated to be around 5.25 trillion pieces of plastics, we now have this increase in storms. So between what is um, what is being put out of houses because of the flooding that occurs and then it has to be replaced, we have all this new waste because of storms as well as what gets out into the environment after a storm, either through our waterways or through our beaches. Now, uh, many of you may have seen this footage. If you haven't, I'm not gonna run it, but I just would like for you to see if you can locate it. I actually was in the Dominican Republic and I actually witnessed some of this, of course, not to this extent, but this is what's happening all around the world every time there's a storm and a storm could just be an abundance of rain. So once this plastic is in the ocean, it then becomes everyone's problem. As you can imagine, any of this plastic could certainly be circulating now in the North Atlantic. Um, another example, of course, that was just what's on the surface. We now are starting to recognize that not all plastics float. And especially things like films, uh, we find a lot more hanging in the water column. In other words, they're neutrally buoyant. They will not go to the surface and they will not sink to the bottom. They will just hang there in the water column, which then becomes a problem for all living things in the ocean. And again, you can see this is another part of the world. Now we're in uh, Bali, Indonesia. Again, the media is giving a lot of attention to this plastics in the ocean, which is really great. But what about the North Atlantic? You know, with all the documentaries that have come out, we haven't seen anything describing plastic being a problem in the North Atlantic. And so therefore the work that we're doing really starts to need some attention. And here's why. So what's different about the North Atlantic to the other regions that I have visited is this free floating algae known as sargassum. And this, this sargassum is actually an essential fish habitat. It is protected by law because so many of our juvenile fish and um, sea turtles look for the sargassum to live in it until they can grow larger. Um, excuse me. So um, anyway, I so witnessing this and knowing that these juvenile fish are living in this environment, they are actually then going to be exposed to this uh, plastic more readily than other parts of the planet. So here's another example of um, just how much trash ends up in this beautiful, uh, what Sylvia Earle calls the rainforest of the sea. Hang on one second, sorry. Surprise visitors, okay, I'm back. Um, so you can see that um, this plastic will accumulate in the sargassum. And the reason why is because of the wind and currents that influence the plastics to accumulate in certain areas like the North Pacific garbage patch. So does the sargassum. And so they end up meeting up together. Now, when we talk about the biodiversity in the sargassum and these juvenile fish, this is a great image to represent just how many different species rely on this sargassum. Now, who you're looking at here is Captain Charlie Moore. He was the one that I sailed across the North Pacific garbage patch with. And so I invited him out to the North Atlantic. And after he explored the sargassum and just saw how much plastic, when he got out of the water, he said, out of all my years, I've never seen anything as tragic as this. So just like the image you saw in Bali, this is happening right here off of our coast. 
So those plastics that are hanging in the water column, we're finding them everywhere. So this conversation about the plastics in the North Atlantic really needs to be exposed. And here's one of the other really good reasons why. Many people do not realize that off the coast of North Carolina is one of the most biologically rich locations in the country, if not in the world. And not only that, we have 16 endangered species that rely on our coast. So when you start thinking about this plastic problem, you can start to immediately see that this plastic is then another stressor on these already compromised species. So just to give you some numbers, because people love numbers, um, every year we're losing about 1 million seabirds and 300,000 marine mammals because of either in ingestion of plastic or entanglement. And that's uh, because the plastics break up into smaller pieces, everything from plankton to blue whale can be affected by it. And that's not even discussing the chemical composition of plastics, as well as the chemicals they adsorb in the ocean, like the dirty dozen, the DDT and the PCBs, the chemicals that we had banned because we recognized that they were carcinogenic. They're still here, just like the plastic. There's nothing that can break them down. And because they're both made out of petroleum, they're lipophilic and are attracted to each other. Now, we may not care about what's happening to the animals in the ocean, but we really should care about what's happening to our children. So a report that came out in 2018 by the American Academy of Pediatrics is pleading with our government to start reining in some of the chemicals that are allowed to be put in plastics. And a lot of these chemicals are endocrine disruptors. Your endocrine system manages every cell in your body. So they are basically saying because children's metabolisms run faster, they are more affected by these chemicals. And what are those impacts? They are saying that diabetes, obesity, cancers, um, behavioral disorders, and reproductive issues are stemming from these chemicals that are found in plastic. So um, really what we should be taking home is that in every aspect of this plastic, whether it be from extraction, from its manufacturing, from our actual use to disposal, we are having negative effects um, because of this plastic. So now we know why we're in trouble. And now we have to talk about how we're going to get our way out of this mess. So. Um, if, if I could ask, and I will just throw that out there for you to ponder, you know, when do you think the three R's started? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, it actually started in the mid 80s. And um, sadly, our recycle rates are still between 10 to 12 percent, still very low. And that's because not all plastics are recyclable. Not that they can't be, but we have not put the energy into actually making them more readily recyclable. So the new chasing arrows have to be circularity. We have got to figure out a way to take the materials that we use and when we're done with them, put them back into a system that we can then reuse them. So I've been working with a company called More Recycling that recently changed their name to Stina. They're a company that actually works up the numbers of how much waste we're producing and what are the benefits to certain materials over others. They work with industry and they work with nonprofits and they really thread the needle on trying to figure out a way for us to build a better economy that's based on circularity. So some of the issues we have with recycling, I know when I give presentations, people always raise their hand like, I recycle, you know, and I'll say, okay, but when you go shopping, do you make sure you're buying uh, materials that are made out of recycled content? You know, because that's really another big piece. But the other big challenge is the, the fact that the uh, virgin plastics are much cheaper than the recycled content. So the... The, um, the plastics industry actually has a leg up on the recycling industry. So we have to come up with ways in order to level that playing field so that there are more options for, for 
industry to actually buy recycled content. Some other really good news, y'all may have heard of Break Free from Plastic. Um, it's legislation that's now pushing through the house to be approved. Um, so I'm not gonna read this to you, but I strongly urge you to look into Break Free from Plastic and then figure out how you're going to speak to your legislators in support of the Break, from, Break Free from Plastic Act. Another really uh, good thing that's happened recently, well, not that recently, but um, President Trump did sign into law the Save Our Seas Act, and it is now Save Our Seas uh, 2.0. And so this is addressing the stuff that's in the ocean. How do we how do we address this derelict fishing gear? How do we address the waste that's coming from land-based sources and ending up in the ocean? How can we help other countries um, with their discharge of plastics into their rivers that end up in the ocean? And then how can we um, come up with better ways of managing our plastic waste? More good news, the, uh, int uh, internationally, the UN has now the Global Plastic Pollution Treaty. So you can see that this is now starting to get some serious legs and has to, in order to protect not only the ocean, but also ourselves. And so now I'm just gonna briefly go over some things that Plastic Ocean Project is doing on this front. Uh, one of the bigger things that we've been involved with is the Blue New Deal Coalition. And again, this is around that circularity that we so desperately need. So we are now working with legislators to really encourage them that they must figure out a way to subsidize recycling. And since the oil and gas industry is subsidized according to the IMF up to a trillion dollars a year, Perhaps we take some of those subsidies and put it on the back end of this problem. So start to really build out this recycling system. And through that process, we're going to create jobs. We're also going to have to reduce the amount of chemicals because that is one of the biggest roadblocks to creating better recycling systems. We need better catchment devices in our storm drains. Uh, we need to um, give perks for waste reduction. So imagine if our government gave tax breaks to companies that were actually using less materials, less packaging. And then again, let's think about a way to tax companies that are using virgin plastics. Another way we can level that playing field and then stricter laws on those chemicals. Um, if you would like to learn more about what we're doing and even get involved, you can check out the bluenewdeal.net website. We also have a, our own lab now here in North Carolina. So we are just one street away from UNCW. And the beauty of that is we have so many UNCW students now being able to do uh, their own independent research projects. We do collaborate not only with faculty at UNCW, but NC State, as well as other uh, universities around the country. And we most recently received um, monies to um, purchase an IN10. It's a, a microscopic FTIR using infrared light to determine what different particles are. And we're also discovering many other uses for this particular instrument. For example, we're talking about hemp plastic. So with this instrument, we could actually look at the degradation rate of hemp plastic versus regular plastics. And then what does that mean as far as how it can affect soil or even uh, people? We allow students to do their own research project. This student wanted to know what was um, in BPA free bottles. And sadly, um, well, the good news was we didn't find any BPA, but we did find a host of other chemical compounds that were far more dangerous, one being a known carcinogenic. We also work on plastics to fuel. We have got to figure out a way to get rid of what's already here. And this research is uh, just about ready to be published. We are pleasantly surprised at the capabilities of turning plastics into fuel, but it all comes down to which plastics you put into the, the instrument in order to produce the fuel. So we have actually teased that out 
and we would like to then move forward with working with island nations as well as uh, cruise ships. So pointing to them like if you use these plastics instead of that, those plastics like uh, PVC or uh, polyethylene terephthalate, use the low density polyethylene and polypropylene, you could actually make fuel to put into your engines in order to um, move your ship. So some really good um, possibilities on the forefront, but it's gonna take all of us to, uh, to figure out how we can do better. Now I did have a video in here and it's called um, our Trees for Trash Initiative. That actually uh, came out of Hurricane Florence when we noticed that we lost so many old growth trees and how much trash was on the ground. So in 2018, Plastic Ocean Project started the Trees for Trash Initiative. And our first time um, doing a cleanup was in 2019 in Bergah. And we picked up 3,700 pounds of trash in just one area. And of course, this was very close to the river. And so recognizing that we could remove what doesn't belong and put trees back what, which do belong. So we came up with a formula for every 25 pounds of trash, we would plant one tree. And in 2019, we planted 1,500 trees. And last year, we participated with other groups such as the um, Cape Fear Tr Alliance, Alliance for Cape Fear Trees, as well as North Carolina Wildlife Federation, where they joined our initiative to start expanding this concept of planting trees and picking up trash. And that was a video, but I don't dare play it. Other initiatives that we uh, helped start was the ocean friendly establishments. We now have close to 250 establishments around the country that uh, have agreed to reduce their use of plastics as well as other ways of mitigating um, their impact on the plantic, while planet while they're uh, running their businesses. So check out the website for that. Um, it's ocean. Uh, oceanfriendlyest.org. And you can also find it on our website as well. And this um, kind of brings it full circle. So as I mentioned, I started as a, a student at UNCW. I traveled the world looking at plastics. I learned about this stuff called sargassum and studying sargassum made, made me realize or learn that sargassum actually accumulates off of our coast. And by finding the sargassum is how I found this very biologically rich location off the coast of Hatteras. And so in 2016, we had put in a proposal to Sylvia Earle's foundation, Mission Blue, requesting that her Hope Spot project uh, that we could include Hope Spot Hatteras. And out of over 200 applicants, uh, Hope Spot Hatteras was one of 17 that was given that distinction. And so then how do we educate the masses, right? So this is where um, Plastic Ocean Project decided because there is very little media about plastic in the North Atlantic, that maybe we were the ones that were gonna have to tell the story. So right now we are working on a documentary called If the Ocean Could Talk. And we're uh, utilizing this fantastic musician who actually plays whale songs on his double bass. So it's kind of a, a beautiful way of bringing in not only the science, but also the arts, as well as really great storytelling. So this documentary was supposed to be out uh, on, on uh, World Ocean Day, June 8th, but because of COVID, it has been pushed back till next year. But stay tuned because we do have a short that's gonna be coming out in the next couple of weeks, and I'll be sure to share it with Virginia so she can get it out to the rest of you. And that will be the preliminary to the entire documentary. Um, this again was a video. So let's just move on to what we can do. So I, I like to say, be wise shoppers and reduce plastic use. You know, and we all are pretty much familiar with these basic things, you know, bring your own cups and bring your own bags. And I know, you know, because of COVID, less places are willing to take your reusable mug. 
So what I have been doing, sadly, is just, you know, if I'm going out to eat, I bring my own beverage. Some places do provide uh, reusable cups, but if not, I will just bring my own beverage until we get over this COVID thing. Um, you know, be, be savvy, you know, learn how to do DIY stuff. One of the things that my daughter taught me to do was make my own laundry detergent. Um, there's all kinds of new ways for us to get what we need without the plastic bottles. There are companies now that are making these sheets that you can throw in your washer instead of buying the big bottle with a giant lid. Uh, you know, throw away for the last time your bottled uh, body washes, buy bars of soap. You know, there's plenty of people here in this area that make beautiful soaps all out of uh, natural materials and essential oils. And they're so much better for your skin. And, you know, to be honest with you, when you buy bottled body wash, really what you're paying for is the water in the bottle. So uh, yeah, I'm encouraging people to, to look up uh, people that are making soap and then take advantage of supporting local businesses. Um, and then, as I had mentioned, you know, so many of us recycle, but how many of us, when we're going to the store, looking to see what's um, in repurposed materials? So that's another really important piece of the story. We, we have to buy those recycled uh, contents in order for that system to work. And then, um, you know, really understanding that we vote with our dollars. Whatever you're spending your money on, you're encouraging there to be more of. And I like to say it's all in our hands. If we don't use it, we can't lose it, right? It doesn't end up in the environment. And then democracy is a participatory sport, right? So we actually are supposed to be running the government and we've gotten a little lost because industry has pretty much been running our government, but we have to speak up. And we're starting to learn now, you know, with what happened with George Floyd that, you know, if we use our voice, if we really work together, we can create the change that we want to see. But we really have to be part of that solution through using our voices. And with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, I would be happy to take any questions. That was great. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, if anyone has any questions, you are welcome to type them into the chat and also to raise your hand and I'll, I'll pass that along to, to Bonnie. Um, Donna is saying we need to be educated on what plastics our local municipalities will accept for recycling. Just because it's made of recyclable plastic doesn't mean it will be recycled. And, uh, and I, I'd add that it, it does seem to be a bit vexing from municipality to municipality what is allowed to be recycled. Uh, one thing I, I hear people say here in Carolina Beach all the time is how, how is it possible we can take all of these various uh, glass and aluminum and various forms of plastic and put them into one bin and ship them off and what what happens after that? How is it all sorted out? Do you have any insight into that that process? Yes, I'd be happy to take that one on and and I'm so glad you mentioned that um, about the you know check with your local um, landfill because it really is important and not every community recycles the same things and in fact we were taking polypropylene which be, would be like your yogurt cups but we are not taking them right now so every time we throw something in the recycle bin that we're not accepting it's actually considered contaminant and another really interesting fact about recycling is that you should never throw anything smaller than a post-it note who knew that, right? Mm -hmm. So so even, I mean, and think of all the small stuff there is with plastic, right? And it really doesn't have a home and, and the small stuff actually is, you know, makes it, you know, able for smaller animals to ingest. So we have to be thinking in that respect always. Um, yeah, that's exactly why we need this circular economy because um, I'll be frank with you, it's not because people are terrible at recycling. That is really not the problem. Yeah, we know people that don't recycle or think that it's bogus, 
but it really is by design that we only recycle 10 to 12%. Uh, we've, we've only set up the system really for bottles, the, the uh, soda bottles and, and beverage bottles, and then your uh, detergent bottles and those types. So your ones and twos and just the bottle shape for the most part. In other words, if you have a container that has a one on the bottom and it's a to-go container, Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, it's a one, I'll throw it in the recycle bin. It's not going to get recycled. The whole system is is really not at all designed for true recycling. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's where this circular economy really comes into play because we have to put the pressure on the government to start reining this in. Um, partly because um the gas industry, you've got the chemical industry, and then you've got the plastics industry, three of the most powerful industries in the world. They're all lumped together and their goal is to produce more plastic. Mm -hmm. So if if they're allowing 12% to be recycled, in other words, because I really don't want the recycling, they want to sell virgin plastics. Right. And that's the problem. It is not people, it is the system. And that's where this Blue New Deal coalition, that's where the break free from plastic, like we are woke now in that respect. Even, you know, when you pull in the UN, they're starting to say, okay, you know, we really have to start paying attention to this because if we're going to increase production, which I have mentioned, then we have better put a system in for encatchment so it doesn't end up in the environment. And that's where we really have to be uh, a voice for this issue, saying this is what we want. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's sad, but the recycling isn't where it should be. But it doesn't mean it can't be better. It can, right. Right. yeah. As we as we try to sort of disincentivize industry, is there a way to up the incentive for individuals? Yeah, and well, you know, as I had said, uh, we vote with our dollars, right? So lots of times, you know, smaller companies have to charge more. They just have to. Right. So it might mean that we don't look at everything as the bottom line is, you know, how much is it going to cost me? But how much is it going to cost all everything, all of us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll give you a really good example is there's a, a, a company that was started by two young women and one of them lives here in Wilmington. It's called Plain Products. And they make shampoo, conditioner, body lotions, uh, facial oils. I mean, it's, but it started with just shampoo and conditioner because um, uh, Lindsay McCoy, who lives here, she used to live in the Bahamas. And she would see these detergent bottles, like she would see all the bottles washing up on the beach in, in uh, the Bahamas, and that she wanted to do something about it. And so her and her sister got together, mastermind this, this product, and it's all vegan. It's absolutely lovely, uh, lovely aromas, and I use it all the time. And um, so, how, so what makes it different than everyone else? Well, they use an aluminum can, and aluminum is the most recycled material so to date. Aluminum. So you order it, and they send it in a box. Absolutely no plastic except for one pump. You can order one pump and then just use that same pump over and over again. And then uh, when it's empty, you send it back to them. Mm -hmm. And it's already prepaid. And then, you know, that you can actually get like every three months it delivered or whatever. And so like now that's part of that circularity we're talking about, right? These these containers stay in a circular system. And when they get too dented up, they then go into another recycling system. And that really has to be like we have to be looking for those businesses and they're cropping up all over the place. Right. I, I mean, another really fine example of that would be the um, the uh, Wilmington Compost Company. Mm -hmm. This was this was a young man, you know, in his mid twenties, who came up with this idea. I think he started with like two green buckets and a bicycle, right? Mm -hmm. And so he he was making an at home compost opportunity for people. So maybe you lived in an apartment and you, you didn't have a place to put compost in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Well, he takes care of that and he's turned it into an enterprise. Mm -hmm. So I think when we start really getting creative about, well, how can we do these workarounds? 
you know, people are a lot smarter. We don't have to have industry solve all the problems. Lots of times we can figure them out on our own and we are. So look for the people in your community that are coming up with really creative ideas on how to mitigate waste. And you're gonna find a lot of people are working on it. Okay. Madison is asking how clean should recycling be in order to be accepted by a facility? Yeah, that's a good question. And you really should clean it. I mean, that's that's one of the, the downside. If it's if it's full of yogurt on the inside, it, it actually mires up the, the whole recycling system. So yes, they're cleaning it, but it makes it a lot nicer for the, that industry. It keeps it keeps the content cleaner if you can keep the, the containers clean. So yes, good question. Rinse them out. Oh, can I answer, add one more thing to that? Absolutely. Okay. So, so the pushback for that is people will say, yeah, but now you're wasting water, you know, and, and, you know, like if you clean things, you know, that's one of the reasons why we went to everything disposable in cafeterias in school, because it was costing us water and, and, you know, we had to hire people to clean the dishes. And my answer to that is the water's recycled. We recycle water. It's not like the water's gone and no good forever, right? We actually have systems in place. You know, that's why, you know, so like we can't think that that water's destroyed because we cleaned with it. So, uh, Bill is asking if you could speak to the current role of educating young people as voices for environmental stewardship. Yeah, I would have to say that the biggest movement right now is with our young people. The, the school teachers are figuring out ways to put this in their curriculum. And there's plenty of ways for us to utilize plastic as, as counting measures, as uh, percentages. Uh, kids are learning about plastics and they really care about what happens to animals. And, and you know, part of, part of why this is really catching on is back in the 80s, we didn't have these cell phones. We didn't have ways to capture animals that were in trouble because of plastic. But today, more and more people have these cameras, have these videos that they can take of animals being injured. And a great example, of course, of that is the straw up the nose of the sea turtle, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, that went viral instantly. I think it's now had something like 400 million views because people care. Like that's that where the rubber meets the road, much like the sargassum, you know, where, you know, when you start to recognize that, that you're, you know, something that you used for five minutes and threw away may have a negative impact on, on a life, you know, then that's a game changer. And, and young people really do care more, it seems, or more affected about it emotionally. Um, but also I get a lot of requests from young people, like they wanna interview me, they wanna learn more. Uh, we have right now a 12 year old who started Maddie's Mission mm -hmm. working with us. And so she started selling uh, aluminum or aluminum, uh, metal straws with a, the, the uh, silicone tip on them and a nice little case. And she started selling them at the school and it gave her an opportunity to share with kids, why are you selling straws? And then she would say, well, did you see the video of the straw that knows it, right? And, and so like just this one child is now educating hundreds of students. Mm -hmm. And it's really great when it comes from them. So I agree, we need to be educating them more. But I think the, the kids are really getting it. I think the adults are more of the problem, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, it's interesting. One of the things that we're seeing a lot in North Carolina, I know you do a lot of organizing for the, the trash pickups throughout the, the Cape Fear region. And, and we're just we seem to be in just this tremendous trash crisis right now. The trash along the roadways has increased dramatically as I assume DOT support um, for picking up trash has, has decreased. Um, what's, what's going on with that and um, what can we do to have a better impact? I, I've gone out and picked up certain sites in Carolina Beach and I, I know you do this as well, only to go back a week later and um, see, it's just full of trash again. It's, yeah. It can be somewhat discouraging. Well, it is discouraging. <laughs> it, it, it is, yeah, more than somewhat, for sure. I, and I, I'm glad you asked that question. 
because it's been the hubbub really here in Wilmington. Yeah. So, you know, when we were locked up with COVID, you know, also the DOT were, right? So no one was picking up the trash. So that was piling up over time. And, you know, a lot of people are complaining what they're seeing on our roadways in, in North Carolina. And part of it is that, that, you know, now they're behind because they haven't been picking up for so long. Um, but it really was instrumental because right now, like if you ask the mayor how many phone calls he gets about the trash on the side of the road, he's like, oh, my gosh, I get so I mean, it's every day people are complaining like it's a new phenomenon. Right. People are really disturbed about how much trash and so much so that there is now a bill in the North Carolina House. It's called HB 100. Mm hmm. And uh, HB 100 is to increase the fines for those that are not tying down their load because that's another really huge problem, right? Um, so that uh, that money, that extra money that will come in for that will actually go into law enforcement to start really honing in. So it's just like the seat belts. Remember what we had to do with get people to put the seat belts on, you know, click it or ticket? It's 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 the same for this now. And so we encourage people we, right now, we have a petition on change.org to support HB 100. So I'd love to have people also go on uh, Plastic Ocean Project's Facebook page, find that petition and then sign it because it's really important. And, uh, and then we want to create some fun signage. We've got these pirates, you know, and it's don't be a bloat you know, cover your load, you know, like make it kind of fun, but just really, you know, remind people like do the right thing. If you do the right thing, it's better for every living thing. So. Very good. Bill is asking how large a raft can the sargassum reach in the Atlantic? How, how big do those sargassum rat rafts? Oh, it, it's amazing how big. And, and the reason why it's called sargassum, Gassum is actually from Columbus. So when he was coming to the new land, now they'd never seen sargassum before. And then they came across, and it was just, I mean, they would literally like, like plow into it, right? It could actually slow them down because it can get very thick. It can go three or four feet deep, right? And, um, and so when he picked it up and looked at it, he could see that it had these air bladders. That's why it floats on the surface. And he said he thought it reminded him of little grapes. So that's what sargasso means is little grapes. Yeah. So he actually named it, oddly enough. Um, so, yeah, it can be up to seven miles long. I mean, we have seen it seven miles long off the coast of North Carolina. But it typically ends up in huge rafts inside that circulation system, inside the gyre, the North Atlantic gyre. But we also see it accumulating, as you may have heard, you know, the uh, the Bahamas are really struggling with so much sargassum. Mm -hmm. And part of the theory behind that is that we're they're cutting down trees in the Amazon at such a rate that it's pro providing all these nutrients from the river into the ocean. And it's actually feeding the sargassum and making it uh, bloom much larger. And so that could be part of the reason why it's such a problem in that region right now. And that's just one theory. But yeah, it can be quite massive. And we love when we come across a big pile of it because we know we're going to see a whole lot of biodiversity. Um, Yasmin was asking if you could let us know where that petition is located again. So oh, yeah, uh, change.org and it's okay. HB 100. HB 100. Very good. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, please. Uh, Madison has typed that into the chat now. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat or raise your hand. And uh, Bonnie, is there anything else you want to to share with everyone? What is your what is your vision for for the future? How do we get rid of all of this trash? I think uh, Sometimes what, what's been interesting about seeing, um, I guess, this COVID trash uh, pile up on the sides of the road in, in North Carolina is sort of the awareness that, well, it's mostly just been out of sight. Now it's not out of sight. So we're, we're more aware of 
some of the impacts, how how nasty this is. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's been a, the big reveal, right? The fact that, you know, oh, there was somebody actually picking this stuff up. And now because they weren't there to do it, we can actually see just how how terrible. And, you know, it's it's not just like everyday people, even the trucks that come pick up your trash. They're also, unfortunately, they're losing stuff too, either when they're dumping it in to your bin or into the, the truck, or even when they're driving down the road. Um, I was driving out to the landfill with a student and we were behind one of the mun municipality trucks, you know, those big bright green ones. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, we had seen this big chunk of cardboard, or cardboard, big chunk of styrofoam in the middle of the road. And it's like three way lanes of traffic. And so you know that it just happened, right? Otherwise it'd be smashed to smithereens. And I was like, well, that's weird. That just happened. And then we are seeing like cardboard boxes fly and plastic bags. And we're like, oh my gosh, it's like raining trash on us, you know? So I sputter around the car that was in front of me trying to find out who it was. And sure enough, that's who it was. Right. So, you know, if we, that's why I said, if we don't use it, we can't lose it because we think we did the right thing with it by putting it in our waste bin and having it hauled off to the landfill. It doesn't mean that it gets there. So the less we use, the less opportunity for those to get lost in the environment. Is there is there any sort of easy to use local resource for for people, um, not just in our region, but even even statewide or nationwide, when you have unusual pieces of trash like styrofoam, which I know you can, you can recycle at UNCW locally, but most municipalities won't take it? Is there any sort of clearinghouse where people can easily put their hands on that information and then take care of their recyclables in an efficient fashion? Yeah, I, I sadly, we need something like that, but there really is nothing in place. Okay. And I, I was asked to look at, I believe it was Brunswick County. Um, they I had given a talk and somebody goes, maybe you could share about other counties instead of just New Hanover. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yeah, great idea. I went to Brunswick's website and it said that they accepted all plastics and no one accepts all plastic. Like that is, that's not a thing, you know? So um, yeah, there really isn't a good place. It, you have to tease it out. Maybe you have to, you know, st stock it up and then take it to various places. Like you had mentioned, uh, UNCW does have a fantastic facility where they do a pre-sort. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we used to do back in the day. We put glass with glass, plastic with plastic. Remember the newspapers? We'd tie them together. Um, and then we went to the single stream where you just threw everything in your recycle bin. And uh, in speaking with Joe Solomon, who runs the landfill, he said that was probably not the brightest idea because because the wet stuff then gets onto the cardboard and the paper. And so, yeah, we were better off sorting it beforehand. I mean, that just makes more sense. So maybe we'll go back to that. I would love to see that happen. Make it easier on the back end of things, right? Instead of us all throwing our trash and say, here, do something with it, mm -hmm. you know? And that's where we could all be a little more conscientious. Uh, we're getting lots of, uh, I, I could go on forever. Uh, we're getting lots of questions, not questions, but compliments for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, good. And someone's saying that, Donna's saying that Mecklenburg County has several recycling sites for metal wood and hazardous waste. Uh, one, one thing I might add really quickly, what about deposits? Uh, North Carolina doesn't have deposits for things like glass, though other states do. Do states that have deposits on recyclables have a better a better outcome? Are you familiar with any data on that? Yes. Um, well, especially environmentally, I can tell you because they they're given value. Mm -hmm. So in New York, we have the bottle bill. Right. And and they have since included like uh, plastic water bottles and, and those types of things. Oh, Some okay. of the things that weren't before included. Okay. And you won't find a bottle on the ground. It's really fascinating. It's because there are people that will 
pick them up if they are on the ground. Right. For a really great example, I was in a wedding back in my hometown and I saw this guy pedaling with this really cool apparatus on the, that he was pulling behind his, his bicycle. And he literally was going through the, the garbage cans looking for bottles. Mm-hmm. And so like I have my stilettos on, you know, and I'm running in between cars and I'm trying to take his picture. And mm-hmm. he's like, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm getting your picture. He goes, why are you taking my picture? So I went up to him and I said, well, I want to thank you for what you're doing. Like this, you're part of the solution. And he was so excited to share with me that, you know, he says, I do this. I make an extra like $300 a month, you know. I mean, people that are close to the fray, it just gives them a way to, you know, make a little money because it does have value and then it keeps it out of the environment. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone. And in fact, our local school had a huge bin. Some people don't want to be bothered with taking the bottles back, right? So they throw the bottles in a giant bin at the school and the school uses it as a fundraiser. Right. So and to answer your question about North Carolina, I believe there have been 11 attempts to get the bottle bill in North Carolina, but the lobby groups, the retail lobby groups are so powerful, they have stopped it every time. Mm-hmm. And that's another initiative with the Blue New Deal is to get the bottle bill in all 50 states. Okay. That has to happen. We all need to use our voice and say, no, this is this is, this is one thing we can do. Great. And if we can tackle the bottles, and we're talking about the aluminum, the cans, you know, the, the glass, um that would really be a big chunk of the waste that we generate okay that's a that's a great that's a great policy issue for sure that that needs awareness i really appreciate that um i think that's it we don't seem to have any more questions coming in this was tremendous bonnie this great information and um we're just so incredibly grateful for you and everything you do for for everyone nationwide and statewide, but most of all in the local community. We're, thank you. We're very grateful for you. Thank so, you. Thank you so much for taking taking time out of your schedule to talk with us today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And Virginia, I love working with you. You're a, a, just a huge asset to this community, as well as to the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. So we're so happy you're part of the team. I am too. Thanks so much, Bonnie. I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.